Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for being in person. Thanks everyone who's online here. Um, I We are the off-campus gallery for MSU Denver here at Center for Visual Art. Diane and Mario are a part of this exhibition that I helped curate or that I curated called Pressing for Change. Um, and I just am here to introduce them. Um, I think almost everyone tall at least knows who they are, but through guests in person, I will share a little info about them and then they will talk about their work. Um, Diane and Mario Laplante met in graduate school uh, pursuing their MFA um, at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and they've been bi-coastal collaborators for 30 years. Um, they embrace layering process and distinctive textures and a meditative repetition. Um, and printmaking has been an essential part of their practice and their work in here. And I have known them both for over 20 years, which I was shocked when I did the math today. I was like, wow, I can't believe I've known you guys for so long. And I'm so grateful that they were willing to participate in this show. Um, you, they travel together, they find inspiration and dialogue through their process. And um, Mario Laplante is the professor of printmaking at Santa Fr San Francisco State University. He regularly exhibits his work and is representative of our collections, including the um, Museum of Modern Art in New York, New York Library, the Tate Gallery, and um, many others. And Diane is a distinguished professor of printmaking and book arts at State University of Plattsburgh and has exhibited in many important collections, including the Museum of Modern Art um, and the New York Public Library, Yale University Art Gallery, and many more. Um, thank you again for being here. And I hope you all enjoy this talk. I'm so psyched that they could still join us. And I'm going to turn it over to them and step out of the way for our folks here. Tell me if there's any terrible feedback with this. Right. With yeah. I don't, you, are you going to mute yourself, Melanie? Yes. On I'm your end? Mute. Okay. Yes. I'm going to mute me now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for your interest in Mario's and my work. We're so pleased to have been included in the exhibition Pressing for Change at Metropolitan State University of Denver's Center for Visual Arts. Many thanks to the show's curator, gallery manager, Melanie Finlayson, to Cecily Cullen, director of CVA, for her commitment to innovation and professionalism, and to our fellow exhibitors. It is a great honor to share the space with artists who make exquisite and thoughtful work and care about repairing our world. Mario and I are both trained as printmakers and the show focuses on printmakers. Um, just a few quick slides. Printmaking has been around for millennia. These images are from the Lascaux Caves, um, 20,000 plus years old. Um, and just the definition of printmaking is having a matrix, putting, applying, there's something in between you and the piece of paper or the fabric. So on the right, you see that pigment was applied to someone's hand 20,000 years ago and stamped on the wall. And on the left, you see the hand acting as a stencil, as in silkscreen, hand put on the wall and pigment probably blown through a straw around the hand. Um, there's a quote that I like to bring at this point of uh, Michael Rothenstein. Um, he was a very influential British uh, printmaker, 20th century. And he, uh, the remark he made is that he, in essence, printing is an embrace. It's one body against another. And um, yeah, and here, of course, the printing press, um, printmaking predates the printing press by millennia. We're seeing two different kinds of presses here on the left, a cylinder press most commonly used now by printmakers and on the right, a platen press. Certainly people still use a platen press and that's um, on the right, much the design of Gutenberg's press. He's credited with inventing the printing press in the West. In the middle of the 15th century, um, there were presses in China predating that by a few hundred years. Um, and I know Mario likes this. You've said that you we like the the way this shows the strength involved. Anyone that has made prints 
Oh, um, no. I know teaching. I just love the first time I ask a student to go ahead and crank that press, crank that image through yeah, the press, like crank more that pressure, matrix. more pressure. Right. Yes. It's, it's really um, a very special feeling. Um, uh, this is my letterpress, SP15, a Vandercook. So in Mario's and my work, we were traditionally trained in both letterpress and etching and lithography. And this is a press made primarily, people certainly print uh, relief on this pr press, re, uh, print images, but it's made primarily for printing movable type, also an invention in the West credited with uh, to Gutenberg. And um, again, predating that in the East. Um, what you're seeing here is a job stick with some text, some, everything's always reversed as those of you have learned either the hard way or the easy way in printmaking um, and you're seeing the California job case when you set type. Um, that's where all the letters are, you know, before this people were handwriting everything. So yeah, um, and that jumps that jump stick will reoccur later on in our talk. It's actually uh, a part of an image that will make a lot of sense about the reversal. Um, Diane and I are collaborators and we've been collaborating for over 30 years. Um, we sort of um, our teaching career has taken us in opposite our coast. I'm on the West Coast, she's on the East Coast, but that didn't stop uh, the collaboration from remaining constant and growing. And we've had sort of a similar journey in our uh, training as artists, uh, but it began in both our case as graphic designer. We were both interested in the capacity of art to have a language that's a little bit more universal and also learning the love of type. That's something that has always kept constant in my work. Um, uh, so one thing that we also happened is that we both were accepted in the program at UW-Madison and Diane at the end of her stay, we all hoped for teaching position. That's something that we always strive for. And Diane was pulled away from our department and invited to SUNY Plattsburgh, a university uh, not very far, upstate New York. And she went for an interview. They kept her and she's been there since. And what was practical for me and for our collaboration is that she landed in a place that's two and a half hours south of Montreal. My family's in Montreal, so whenever I went to see family, Diane was sort of included in that where I would travel across the border, work with her during the winter and also doing it in the summer. So this biannual uh, collaborative effort that we started was quite easy to uh, maintain. The book that we did, the first one is uh, actually that's the second one. And at that time, I was very much, very much devoted to lithography as a medium. And um, we decided to work on a project titled Untitled Book About Stairs. It is basically a piece of paper, as you can see, in a strange uh, uh, triangular shape that gets to be unfolded. And for many of you who are within my age group, you'll remember the, those maps that we had to unfold to travel and to sort of go places. And that's what that emulates for us. Um, and the bringing them back to its original state is always a struggle. And so is with that print. But it opens up from a dark black, a monochromatic side. Um, with imagery icons of stairs that Diane and I both work with at the time, and it unveils itself into a quite a beautiful, rich uh, blue uh, um, surface. And uh, there's, it's printed, it's a Japanese paper that's printed on both sides. And so Diane will have chosen to sort of, when coming to the main part where the poem, which she wrote, it's a poem that Diane wrote, we will read it for you. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add, right, that it's this lovely Japanese paper. And in a way, um, I mean, one side is earthly and one side is heavenly, I guess, or cosmic or how, I, however you want to think about that. We really shifted the colors in that way. And, and I should just say here that putting together these kinds of presentations, anyone who's done it, you know, Mario and I, we say 30 plus years. It's it's kind of a lot on the plus side of the 30 mm -hmm. years. Um, but we really just learn a lot more by pulling this work together. So we're, we're always noticing things. And this was a favorite piece from some time ago. Um, and, you know, we all had experienced that trying to put a map back, fold it back, get it back into the glove compartment of the car. And um, this book actually can be folded back up a few different ways and still fit back into its 
into its triangular enclosure. Mm -hmm. And the poem, Mario, you're going to start. Yes. Uh, St. Peter's, uh, St. Paul's, St. Patrick's, St. John's the Divine, St. Martin's in the Field, Chartres, Sachica, Notre Dame. Dachau, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Frisia, Violet, Iris, Rose, Blood, Fire, and Pillars of Smoke, Groucho, Harpo, Chico, Chico and Zeppo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the text had a lot to do, uh, our human condition of the, uh, had a lot to do with um, the simultaneity of comedy and tragedy and joy and grief. And this was, Mario mentioned that it was our second project together, but it really was an important jumping off point. I, I believe it was the last project we did before I moved to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. This is it unfurled, you know, one side of it. The other side of where where you find the poem. So, and we're so thrilled to know that Kahoru and Andrew are here. Um, the next bit of work we're going to show you um, is happened because of Kohoru Otani, who was a student of mine here at the State University of New York in Plattsburgh for four years, quite a few years ago. I'm not counting and um, one of the best students I ever had the opportunity to work with. And her her parents came and visited while she was here and they extended an invitation for me to come and visit Japan. And they did that more than once when Kohoro moved back with Andrew to Japan, the invitations kept coming. And I remember one day saying to myself like, oh, too bad I can't go to Japan. And then, I happen to have the one and only tarot card reading I ever have had. And um, in that, the person said that I was going to go on a trip that I didn't think I could go on. And that was obvious then that that, that place to go was Japan. And the Otanis and Kohuru and Andrew hosted us. And um, we went to Nara and Kyoto and Shizuoka, where... Um, Kohoru is from and Tokyo. And here in Kyoto, Mario and I in general visit um, cemeteries. I assume that uh, many of you may share that passion. There's so much to be seen, both aesthetically, historically. And when we were in Kyoto, we went to, I'm sorry to say, I don't know the name of this. I did at one point know the name of this cemetery. But because um, these are cremains, the the uh, it's it's very dense, and this this cemetery went up the side of a hill, and um, we noticed as we walked around where we didn't have we didn't have the language we were this was all unfamiliar to us, but what we noticed was every marker had these beautiful these recesses here. You can see my cursor, right? Yes. Here, okay, and you know obviously places for flowers, places for offerings. Um, and we um, saw that down at the bottom of the hill was a trough, a stone trough with a fountain with water running and um, bamboo ladles and bamboo buckets. And we watched people that were coming to honor the people that uh, their ancestors and who had passed would take the bucket of water and then um, go up and fill a uh, fill these recesses with water and mario told me that he recently learned that sometimes people would put sake into that little that little recess um to quench the thirst of of people or this, is, this is our understanding of the people on the other side and so when we were and, and obviously you know people i know in the jewish tradition we often leave a stone on the gravesite and certainly flowers um, i've done a lot of photographs of flowers that are weeks old, right? People leave all sorts of um, offerings at grave sites. So after we were in Japan, we decided to make this book. You can see the scale of it here. I'm holding it on the right and it's in an exhibition on the left. And we used, um, we photographed when we were there, these recesses and you know, not only did people bring different offerings and you sort of it wasn't the rainy season when we were there. You could tell, right, if a recess was dry, someone hadn't 
hadn't been there recently. The other thing is it was the cherry blossom season and um, and lots of things were blowing around. And so there was a lot of embellishment by nature of these of these recesses. So we did a lot of photographing of those while we were there. And then when we decided to make this book, probably a year or two after we were there, this book called Offering, we um, used the text, um, one of uh, various translations of the Mahayana Buddhist Heart Sutra. So I'll show you this book entitled Offering. And Offering this is our title. It's about six and a half by 13 and a half by 20, and it's a panel accordion structure. And uh, one of the things that Diana aspired to is always sort of integrate new technology. And at the time, it was the capacity to photograph and eventually print those photographs on Japanese paper. And that was sort of a, a something that became very important for any future work that we did. Um, Go ahead. Dimi. Right, doing that digitally and and then also using letterpress and um, our press names. Mario and I just how long have we been? We just really Mario's press name is Gravel Press, which is his grandmother's mm -hmm. family's name, and my press Mooncash Press is a American like transliteration into English of the city in Hungary that my from where my grandfather, my mother's father, emigrated to the United States in the early part of the 20th century. And um, it's interesting that, you know, completely uh, serendipitously, we both honored our grandparents in in the naming of a press. And that press, that press name stays with you for your entire career. Um, so here, let me share offering with you. The epigraph we used here is an excerpt from an African-American spiritual. And when it was night, I thought it was day. And again, the translation from the Heart Sutra, there is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase, no ignorance, no end of ignorance. No old age and death, no end of old age and death. No suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering. No attainment, no non-attainment. And we finished with a quote from the Buddha, all things vanish in splendor, all things in themselves are evanescent. And then our colophon page, again, photographically, transparent printing of that cemetery. In a Kyoto cemetery, mourners leave signs of their visit and nature embellishes those signs. And it goes on to talk about the specifics of the book. And you can see that we made 25 copies of that book, which we're happy to have, you know, different collections have that book and we've been able to show the book. Um, it's a great pleasure for us. So the, being able to uh, uh, to print the photographs that were taken that day uh, allowed for an almost seamless relationship of our physical experience of the cemetery and the essence of our emotional journey. And it became clear as we selected different locations for our trip that the outside world, the experience, the visiting basically really came uh, strongly into our working relationship in the studio. Uh, Diane and I uh, had a residency at the Dedalo Center for Contemporary Art in Cast Castiglione a Castoria in the province of Abruzzo, Italy. We had both been to Italy before. In fact, um, many of us have. Uh, Melanie and Kohur also were in Venice. Uh, but this part of Italy was really all new to us. It's about 90 minutes from Rome in one direction and 30 minutes from Pescara. Now, the, it's also um, located centrally and around the Apennine Mountains. This is an example of the press that was present there, a matching press that we ended up using for a series of dry points. Um, and what was interesting about our visit in the area, uh, not only Abruzzo was peppered with hills and mountaintops, but also villages and um, uh, inhabited with lots of ruins. And it came to our attention also, as you can tell, beautiful, vineyards and um, 
Olive, olive olives. Groups. Thank you, olives. In fact, there was uh, one point where we came to a location where there were 200 year old olive trees just pulled out of the earth and just lined up that were going to be brought into different centers of different villages. It was really an interesting picture. But one thing, as we noticed by visiting all the churches, uh, that in many cases, the structure had somehow been destroyed. Uh, there's an example, for instance, that a church may have been built in 1965 and then rebuilt in 1079 when an earthquake occurred and it rebuilt again. And what we saw is the, uh, the attempt at the village people, the villagers who lived in those places to keep those beautiful structures alive by painting them, uh, restoring them as best as possible with earnestness. So as our, we traveled around different places, we did take notes, we took photographs, and in many cases took details of the actual ar architecture of the place. And that brought was brought into our work that we did, which was quite a dimensional uh, scope. Excuse right, me, and I just want to add here, Mario, about the the, the earth, because this was a very earthquake prone region. And I think I can't remember if it was before or after we we went. There was a serious earthquake, but yeah, that that building, you know, every first built in nine six five, then destroyed by earthquake, then rebuilt, and at some point, just as we're having, I'm thinking I'd love to go see if it was how what the ratio of years that the, the building was actually stood to when it was in ruination, you know, but but this commitment to rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding was was really quite moving. And as Mario said, we that these are you're going to talk about these constructions that we made related yeah. to They're like visual poetry, intentional or otherwise um, found at every turn and boards brought together with gouache. Um, and it was really the first time where we investigated the sculptural possibility of paper and uh, hinging. Um, so the first one that we're seeing here, uh, the names actually make reference to the experience as well. They're all called Abruzzo by number and then followed by a title. This first one is called Dome, and it's about 10 by 11 inches. And these are, they're framed in shadow boxes um, and they are in like slight relief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The next one is uh, more of a festive piece. It's called Festival. And uh, next one is called uh, uh, Lantern on the left. And on the right was definitely an attempt at studying the inside and the floor plan of a church. Um, and that one is called Floor Plan. On the left side is Lantern. Uh, and on the right side, sorry, it's gate. The one on the right, on the left side is gate and the one on the right is called piazza. And uh, the last two on the left is called yellow cross. Again, about nine by eight and Adriatic um, uh, on the right. Right, and we were not too far. We were in the Apennine Mountains, but when we first, we didn't get to the Adriatic that often. It was maybe only about an hour away, but it was a very special experience to stick our toes in that water for the first time in it. That um, is part of uh, the inspiration for this this piece on the right. And um, the next, you know, we this was this was a residency, as we said, and then we started realizing we could make our own residencies. Um, we wound up a couple of years later renting an artist studio in Devon, in in England. Um, we were in a place called Honiton, and uh, there were, uh, among many other wonderful things about that area, there was a lace making tradition. Um, and also we visited many cathedrals, churches and cathedrals, not Catholic in this case, but Anglican. And uh, so many, again, you know, I mean, we we would go into a cathedral and then meet, you know, run into each other, but go our own separate ways. And at the end of every day, Mario and I talked about this, that we would take photographs, look at the photographs at the end of the day when we were back at the studio. And it was really neat to see, like, you know, there were certain things that we both absolutely took photographs of and other things where I'd, oh, where was that? Or he'd say, where was that? You know, like just, there's so much to see. Um, in this, you know, the ceilings are amazing and those, Decorative objects are referred to, are called bosses, B-O-S-S-E-S. -S -S -E and my understanding is that they 
they're hiding. They're there for decoration. I don't think, but don't quote me on this. I don't think they're structural, but maybe they are. But they hide where the joints come together in these vault, vaulted ceilings. And you're either lying on the floor or like really crooking your neck. Or in some places, they had these wonderful carts with mirrors that allowed you a, a, a more comfortable view of what was going on in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And so we made, you know, we in that studio, we brought some pre-printed materials. You'll see this, uh, what you're seeing as that grid is a lithograph. Um, uh, we, we brought multi these you'll see these grids we used over and over again to make these pieces that uh, re were responding to what we were seeing in Devon. And this first piece is called English Garden. You know, it's mixed media collage. You can see a lot of it is cut away and it's 12 by 10 inches. This is called Garden Plan. And I was just noticing earlier and after the fact too is realizing that the lace that we saw, the beauty of the lace really uh, comes through in the, the work that we did at the time. Right. Like I'm not sure if we would have been cutting away mm -hmm. as much. Yeah. If we hadn't mm -hmm. been seeing that lace. Uh, this is called Standing Stones. We were not far from the Stonehenge. We didn't have the good fortune to see other Standing Stone monuments, but um, Stonehenge was, uh, as those of you that have gone, really special. And actually, Mario, I just remembered, I know we're not supposed to get off, we need to keep moving along, but to remember we saw, there were a lot of people there, tourists, and we saw a person who was didn't have sight, who was blind, I took and, a, photograph, um, and yeah. a person was standing next to her describing Mm. Stonehenge yeah it was, it was really very, beautiful very but touching. and at the site you know like um, she could feel the wind and smell what was yeah, anyway it was it was quite moving um and another piece from that series it, this is called spheres and you can see that pre-printed lithograph the grid behind which we had we worked on top of and these areas Mario, I'm sorry. Are these cut out or is that collage? Uh, the circle, the spheres work painted individually right. and collaged. Yes. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, sometimes we know. <laughs> anyway, hopefully you can relate to revisiting something from a while ago and you're like, what now? Okay. Um, this is called Devon Grid. We did the math before. But I forgot to write it down. I don't know between three and four hundred little paintings, mm -hmm. one one inch square paintings that we passed back and forth. And one of the things that's always an issue, I think, for any artist, and certainly when you're working with someone else, is knowing when something is complete. So there was a lot of passing back and forth. Um, and then there'd be a, a separate station where it's like, okay, these we agree are finished. And then there's another station where things are in constant progress. And this one, one of my favorites from that series is called Bosses. Yes, I remember when I heard, when I saw this person describing um, the landscape to the person who couldn't see, it was really revelatory to, to understand the, the, the possibility of description in words. It was quite touching. One mm -hmm. thing that happens in our collaborative effort is that there is this effort, this attempt at organizing the, pay, the space so work can flow. And generally, like Diane was just explaining, there is a place where it's common, where the work is laid out. And it usually goes back and forth two or three times. I have my space. Diane has her space. She produces her own work during that time as well. And so do I. So there's a two layers of work going on at the same time. Loving cemetery, loving the beauty of um, Japan and certainly uh, British landscape, Devon. The next body, the next body of work that we did um, was primarily by, for the love of water, the body of water. We sort of at that point uh, rented a place in Maine, Indian, Pain, in, in Indian Point. And a lot of the images that you are you're about to see are kind of um, a coming to um, an understanding of the implication of the seascape, the rocks. Uh, it was quite a beautiful location. The first one that you see here is about 610 by 16, uh, very direct on board, uh, watercolor 
collage in uh, graphite, and this one's called um, Deluge. And the one on the left is Calming, Combing, and Outcropping. Right, and you can and you can see stamping and pushoir. Mm -hmm. Those of you that are familiar with that, and then on the right, that I know is Mario. The all those circles are a separate piece of you know again almost lace, you know, but a cutout yeah. piece that is then collaged. Yeah. Um, this one is called the one on the left is allure, and the one on the right is high tide. And it's interesting in the process of working where things stops. Um, I would say, like, I think it's finished, Diane. I don't, I don't think it needs any more. Then she takes it and puts it into a different sphere, and it actually um, very often finds the exact answer that it needs. Um, so this back and forth is an interesting um, understanding of our own limitation, but also our own aesthetic choice and how we make your own work and how it can be applied to someone else's vision. Right, and, um, and also that, I'm sorry, Mario, um, that, um, yeah, knowing when something's finished and and also having, you know, because we would take three or four weeks for these sort of residencies is really being able to put something aside for a while. You know, everyone that that is listening, that's an artist that has done, you know, you need to come back to it to see, oh, yes, it is done or it's not done. Right. You need to. Have, it seems to me, at least in my experience, there definitely needs to be some time to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, yeah some walking away from it. This is another one from this is that other one was high tide. This one is low tide. A lot of stamping there. Yeah. And we decided to also um, go to a different location. In this case, we went to Newfoundland a few times where other pieces were done. And of course, very much the uh, reflection of the landscape too. Those are quite small, uh, including collage and direct painting. The one on the left is called drift and broom, broom or fog on the right. What I love about this, uh, any kind of digital presentation, it does make the color very vibrant. So that's really beautiful to see. Here it's on the left side, it's called Trio, and on the right is res Resilience. Uh, in the preparation to our working together, we generally decide on what to bring. And what's interesting is that we ship a box, at least I do from the West Coast. And then what I realized by looking at the content of the box is what I'm going to be working with and its limitation. And the preparation for that is something that has quite an impact on the collaboration that we do, and it's going to come up later on as well. Uh, the one, Here, the upper left corner is called Flotsam. To its right is Great Island. At the bottom uh, left, it's called Fathom. And the mechanism piece on the lower right is called Harbor. Um, like I was saying earlier, one of the things that um, I collect a lot of paper, both prints and also found paper that's uh, manufactured. And I had a wonderful set of old uh, screen printed wallpaper. And most of the paper that's used in, in um, general uh, um, large scale work, it's usually wood pulp. And it's uh, generally it just ages and foxes and gets yellow very quickly. And I had this beautiful collection, but I generally love the back of it a lot more than the front. So not wanting to deal with the acidity, I took this the piece and then scanned them and printed them on Japanese paper, send them to um, Indian Point and put them aside, knowing that Diane and I will at one point do something with it. Um, right. And, and I remember they were they were we were working on many different things. And these sat there for quite some time. Like we were there for three weeks. I feel like we didn't pick these up maybe until the third week. Oh, yeah. And the end. Yeah. Right. And I think what happened is one day I just noticed those and we're not constantly talking, narrating to each other about what we're doing. So I picked those up that Mario had brought and I made these drawings. And then later that day, he discovered that. Well, we'll show you the series in a moment. The group is called Schema. Um, when he looked at it, I said, oh, by the way, I worked on those those Japanese paper wallpaper, you know, prints that you digital prints that you brought. So he took a look at them and he said, oh, I, I think they're finished. Like he I think it's the only time I can remember where he looked at something and and, you know, like a like maybe I hadn't left any room for him. You know, I mean, you weren't <laughs> saying it. You weren't saying it angrily or anything like that. You were just like, oh, I, 
I think they're kind of nice as they are. And I was like, really? Well, give it give it some more time, you know, look and uh, spend some time with them. And then, I mean, these are very special to both of us because they did see, seem finished. And then Mario, these are all just called schema one, two, three, and so on. And Mario's embellishments are like this pushoir here of that star, right? I had drawn these forms. I believe you drew these. We can't always, we're not always able to do that. I think in this group, it's a little easier um, to see, but but they, so the point is they weren't finished. <laughs> um, here's, I know that this is something that Mario added, these sort of striations. Mm -hmm. There is this one quote that Albrecht Durer says that I, I noted here. It says, one man may sketch something with his pen on half a sheet of paper in one day, and it turns out to be better than and more artistic than any other great works of art, uh, which is which its author labored with utmost uh, diligence for an entire year. The gift is a miracle. Sometimes you really work hard on a piece, and it develops quite well. And sometimes it just takes a few, a few hours. And that's what's re really a, a miracle in some ways in art making is that you just have to stop at the right moment. And this came about so fast and so well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and they just feel sweet and soft. And mm -hmm. um, I guess it's the last one in that. Yeah. Maybe this is the last one. Um, or nope. This is the last one. That one's called Vane. V A N E. No, no, no. These are all just called schema. Oh, sorry. Okay. Right, you jumped ahead. I did. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But we can. But um, yeah, I'm trying to see here. Right, I think this is you, Mario. But anyway, sorry to get into the minutia. Um, yeah, this series, this this one is, um, uh, I start, this is from a, a group of work that we call um, Shadow and Light. And it's as simple as, and we have many, you know, we're showing you like samplings from a series. Um, and these started as, the, the, these are 13 by 13 inches. This one is called Circus. But um, they started with just um, photographs, kind of snapshots that I was taking of shadow and light. You know, this, you know, very attractive um, dichotomy, right, that uh, we all are aware of and embrace. And um, the we started, I think we said this already, but we got in the habit of, of bringing sort of the first layer of things along with us, this I know we made these in Maine at one point. We went to Maine a few times to the same place. And this, for example, this piece is called Pageant. And you know, Mario had asked me when we were putting this together if I had done any manipulation in Photoshop for these, and I didn't. This pink and that blue was what the light was doing at like five or six o'clock in the morning on the wall of the place we were in in Maine. Um, and then, of course, the rest. So those those are um, digital prints. And then we worked on top of those. Here's um, some others from that series. This one is called Tunnel. Mixed media and collage. Again, these are all 13 by 13 inches. This one is called Plum, like with a B at the end, like plumbing the depths of something. Concurrence. Currency, this this got its title from um, this, this part here. We collaged, we both had currency from pre-Euro Europe. So drachmas and lira and francs, and that's how that title, that's what this part of the collage is, currency. This one is called hearth.
and Vane, as in a wind vane, V-A-N-E, north, south, east, west. You can see the directions. Mm. Um, one, I'm not sure when those, the following ones were created, but I remember I, at the time I was visiting a dear friend of mine, artist, Bay Area artist named Emily Payne. Emily Payne had, uh, was in the habit of getting a lot of books, old books, covers, uh, would usually use the fabric from the cover and work from them. And she still does and would accumulate lots of book boards. And very often she'd say, Mario, I'm overwhelmed by all these. Would you mind taking them? And I would leave her studio with a stack. Uh, so I brought these with me uh, to uh, Diane's for a work session. And we decided to um, create these uh, sort of diptych, uh, definitely diptych uh, that would emulate the book because in essence, there's so many parts of it that actually make reference to the end sheets, uh, colors are printed. Uh, so we went right, about like to, this here. This was on an end sheet. Yeah, from mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that we didn't draw. This was found. Mm -hmm. The other things are added. Yeah. So this is called Exodus. And they're about six by eight, very dimensional. Um, so you could hold them like they were a book and the, the center sort of emulates the centering, the gutter of a book as well. This is called Amulet. And they're um, presented in shadow boxes also because mm -hmm. they're pretty dimensional. And this adjuration. Next one is chapter and verses. Listen and learn, that's a very direct. Myth. Pastiche. Penned in. Oh, penned in, yes. Yeah, penned in uh, Persia. And the last one is Serenade. Ah. Yes. And I uh, got, this. I got Susan, uh, Diane to come to California, which was a great event. So um, landed. We had figured, I mean, she's great at locating the place to go. She does incredible research, finds the place. And she found this house in Gualala about, I would say, you know, three hours north of San Francisco, like going up winding Highway 1. And it was beautiful uh, sunset. Um, in fact, in what we see right now is Phoenix Nest, this sort of jet uh, peninsula that goes into the ocean. And that you can see a partial um, beach where, unbeknownst to us, there were going to be a colony of seals leaving there, living there for the duration of our stay, which became quite cacophonous. Um, <laughs> and at that point, uh, also a lot of materials were sent and um, such beautiful images that you created, Diane, and we'll talk about how they came to be. Yeah, um, the, uh, let me see. Oh yeah, okay. So these are, um, those, these are linoleum cuts, brought those with us. You'll see how those um, uh, find their way into other pieces. And, um, the, so, so, oh, I know that, that there, the difference here. So, right. We've been using digital underprintings, um, and what was new about this body of work was, um, that the, uh, I was scanning objects rather than taking photographs. So you'll see this one, we did a series of, of four pieces using these urns. This one is called Elixir. And using the same background, this is called libation. And, you know, partly I don't want to share what the background is, but uh, it's also fun to, I'll, I'll tell you, this is called potion. Um, and, you know, the urn is treated differently. The background is treated differently for each of these. This last one is called brew. So pushoir and stamping. And what I scanned here was a beautiful um, felt trivet from Tibet or India that was given to me as a gift from my friend Catherine Clark. Mm. Um, 
And this is Diane actually uh, attempting at one of the final touches of a series that we did at the time too. Very square. We noticed that a lot of the work that we do is square, and that's uh, the series is called Cash. And cash has definitely double meaning for us, uh, you know, referring to uh, stored somewhere or to a place where it is hidden. Uh, but it also, also meets short term computer memory where information is stored for easy retrieval. Diane has an extensive collection of small bowls, and she went through, I think, really revelatory process of just scanning her bowl by placing them face down onto a scanner. And that's what we see here. And these are titled, uh, no special titles, just cache number one, cache number two, and so on. And here um, there is more manipulation with, like there is some things happened in Photoshop before uh, we then took them to California and did the analog work. So this is from that series called Cache. Mm -hmm. It totally changed the perspective, like um, a very shallow perspective, which I think makes the work interesting. Right, especially since they were, now that you mention it, you know, that they were bold, you know, they were mm -hmm. dimensional objects, right? And mm -hmm. yet, I agree, there's a flatness to them. This was, I know this basket was a gift from my sister Janet, um, and I confess, I'm pretty sure that um, they, the, the, um, basket was from Africa, and she can fill me in later if I'm correct about that. She's brought me so many different gifts from so many different places. And this, these times that Diane and I spent together are generally very private, and Janet was able to be with us for about a week and witness our work together, which from her perspective was really refreshing to see. It was lovely to have her. She was actually right, working on a book at the time. Right. Well, the other thing this just reminded me of, of Mario, Mario takes longer to make decisions, I would say, than I. There's so much. I'm like, okay, let's let's glue that down, let's glue that baby down, and he won't he won't do it yet, you know, like he won't because things have to keep, you know. And then an hour later, I see that he's moved some of these. See, these rings are individual pieces. So then, is, you know, that neutral space where everything is pending and potentially finished. We visit together and then we discuss, you know, right. what can be done, what cannot be done, and final decisions are reached. But for sure, he's a much more patient person than I am because I'm always like, let's glue those babies down. And he's like, nope, <laughs> let's let's spend some more time with them. This is that last one in that series. And even though I feel like in some of the earlier work, we're definitely referring very specifically to the area that we're in. Um, that's not always the case. I think in these previous pieces, right? It is, doesn't matter that we're on the coast of California, but this one seems, you know, this this one did speak to that. It seems to mm -hmm. me it did. Ah, and um, so then Melanie, blessed Melanie Finlayson, invited us to be in this exhibition. The purpose of this talk. And I kind of like lost track of my papers, but I know. Oh, here it is. Um, this is some of you may be familiar with this. This is the Svalbard Global Seed Bank in Norway. This seed vault safeguards duplicates of more than a million seed samples from almost every country in the world with room for millions more. It's way in northern, as you can tell, Norway. It's built underground. Its purpose is to back up. It's a backup gene bank collections to secure the foundation of our future food supply, sometimes referred to when I'd be reading about it. The, and this is not, this is by far the largest and most comprehensive seed bank, but there are seed banks all over the world. Um, this is sometimes referred to as the doomsday vault. Um, and, you know, the environmental, you know, Melanie asked us as part of this, her curatorial vision, was to think about environmental concerns. And Mario and I started thinking and researching a bit about um, diversity of seeds and plant diversity and the loss 
of that diversity and what that means. Um, and you'll see the work in the show, which we're about to get to, um, reflects that, was inspired by those concerns. And I did a little, there's, I think in the gallery, there's a, there's a graphic that we used um, that, for example, in terms of diversity, in 1903, there were 544 different kinds of cabbage being grown on this earth. In 1983, there were only 28 different kinds of cabbage being grown. In 1903, there were 497 different kinds of lettuce. And in 1983, only 36 different kinds of lettuce. So, um, oh, and by the way, Alan, this is a neat shot of inside the vault. Um, and here, this is a hopeful slide, you know, in, uh, as you all have heard, you know, about heirloom vegetables, right, and trying to reclaim some of this diversity. The image on the right is from a agricultural fair in Belgium that was celebrating the tomato and its variations, and on the left, various squashes. Um, after reading about the the thinning of diversity, it was a pleasure to see images like this. Mm -hmm. And also in your reading too, the, the concept of food desert as well, where not only is it not diversity, but actually food scarcity, where it's not right. fresh food is not accessible. Um, I did some preparation for the work where I wanted to investigate and work with a different tool, the laser cutter, and we found um, an image, a beautiful uh, image of seeds, varieties of seeds, and they, all, they do show in the work later on, but these are examples of seeds that I cut at different size. And it, I must say, I want to thank uh, Melanie for inviting us because uh, up till that point, Melanie, we were sort of pretty much working directly collage and um, on different location, but that caused us to go back to the print shop, the printmaking lab together to actually investigate our approaches. And it's been very fruitful in, in, in the jump that we did in our love for printmaking. I'm really pleased. And as you can see here, there was some uh, extension of what we did, uh, what Diane did with the bowls is that we continued on by, in this case, scanning plates. Uh, so the plates were brought to the scanner face down. And what you see on the left are images that we taken over different trips. Some of them are from um, Britain, cut, and then also put around the plate so that both the plate and the prints would be scanned at the same time. Right, so we created these masks. Anyway, it was really, really um, you know, just like in any medium, right? You develop your methods and, mm -hmm. you know, you try something and, um, they have these wonderful surprises. This is um, right. We we did letterpress again, chose to do letterpress in certain situations, and that led to this piece. The all four pieces that are in the show, these four triptychs. I mean, we have uh, there's other pieces in the show, but these were made specifically for the show. What's their size again, Mario? They're uh, 18 inch high by 48 inches 48 wide. 48 inches, right? Like Large triptychs, yeah. triptychs right? And um, this one is called Mortal Coil. I mean, and we're, you know, again, not to get into the technical too much, but that's we made knots with wires and and scanned that. That's what's on the left. And in the middle is the uncoiling of those knots. This one is called Seed Bank. Mm -hmm. This one's called Steadfast. And in this case, uh, the green are actual a discovery that we both did and using those cutouts and create holograph and relief them. It was uh, playful and a good discovery for us. Yeah, and also the scanning, um, making a decision to scan a plate, like the plates in this, which we found in some secondhand store through a piece of tracing paper. So there's there's this loss of detail that we were, you know, found aesthetically really beautiful. And this one is um, I, I, one of that whose title is most, I think, special, at least to me. Um, and it's called We Are Hungry and You Feed Us. And Diane has a wonderful, wonderful well, story. Well, a quick, and I'm looking at the time, though. I want to just be careful, but I, I would like to tell you this one story. 
if I were there, I'd see whether you were nodding your heads or not, but where this title came from, and uh, Mario and I are, we're, we're almost too young to remember the automat. I remember the automat a little bit. Um, so those of you that this was, um, I, I just learned, I had no idea that it only, these machines only took nickels. The first one was in Philadelphia, um, but they were throughout the country and was this, although there were people behind those, but it was this automation and you can see how it was set up and they were large spaces. And at least in the North, what I read was, I mean, I don't know why, why am I going off on a tangent about the automat, except that it's so interesting. Um, but there were, there was uh, a lot of, um, pe all people were welcome, different, you know, people from different socioeconomic uh, strata and race. Um, you know, there wasn't, like everybody went because it was such a um, phenomenon, I guess. So anyway, the story where that title came from, um, We Are Hungry and You Feed Us, is from um, a story that Patty Smith tells in the book she wrote um, that I hope many of you have read or will read called Just Kids, uh, which is about her young life in New York with Robert Mablethorpe in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, I think. And they were they were broke and struggling and they were both artists. She, of course, also became a musician and living sometimes on the street, sometimes like in the Chelsea Hotel. Um, and she, you know, money was really scarce. And she said she was hungry all the time. And she saved, there was a sandwich that she really wanted, which was a cheese and lettuce sandwich. And... It was 35 cents, so seven nickels, if I do my math right. And so she saved up her seven nickels and she went to the automat and the price had gone up to 40 cents. And she was standing there, you know, looking, staring, and someone came up to her and said, you know, do you need some help? And she turned around and it was Allen Ginsberg, the great poet, who she certainly recognized. He had no idea who she was. She was younger um, and unknown at the time. And he said, oh, I'd be happy to, you know, he spotted her the extra nickel and he also bought her a cup of coffee. And then he asked her to join him and they sat down. So, again, she's just sort of like overwhelmed with the fact that this person whose work she loves, you know, she's making these connections. And she realizes after they sit there and chat for a little while that he, you know, as you know, Ginsburg was gay and he it takes him a little while to realize that Patty Smith is a woman. And when he does, you know, he politely excuses himself because he's not interested in this particular date. Um, so that happened. And years later, when Patty Smith was well known and she had occasion to to meet and then come to know Allen Ginsberg, he remembered that incident and he said to her um, that he was embarrassed. He said, I'm so sorry about the first time we met. And, you know, what those circumstances were or whatever that I left you at that table. And she just said to him, my memory of that moment was I was hungry and you fed me. So that's where that um, title comes from. I love that story, Diane. <laughs> Thank you. Well, oh. uh, we have some leftover images here of or we did uh, gather last time and created these gifts package of seeds. Um, and they're uh, to be had. I believe they're in the gallery, so whoever's there can take uh, them if they want. Um, right, and, and Melanie is going to, because again, we were supposed to be there in person, but we shifted gears. Thank you for everyone's patience where that's concerned. So Melanie, I believe, is going to leave these in in the gallery. Um, the, the bush beans that we chose are drought resistance and resistant and good at high altitude, so seemed appropriate for Denver. And um, we just want to thank you and leave you with uh, this quote by Wendell Berry. And at let, you know, ask you if you have any questions for us. And thank you again for coming. Thank you for the opportunity. Melanie, are you going to jump back in or? There's Melanie like out having dinner somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how you want it, if the mechanism for asking questions is in the chat or 
you know, how do you want to go about that? Yes, people are welcome to unmute themselves or if there's anyone in the audience oh, great. with any questions. I don't know if anyone has any. There's only a handful of people here, but if anyone has questions, you're welcome to ask. We'll take a few minutes. Lots of claps. Thank you, Diane and Mario. That was so great. I I have a question if no one else does. Okay. Uh, your collaboration, I loved how you talked about working together and your choices, all of that. What what is next? Oh, thank you for asking that. And we didn't even did we didn't ask you to ask that, did we? <laughs> no, so. no, no, you didn't ask me to. Okay, because I'm Mario curious. and I said, and we've done this, you know, if there aren't, we certainly sometimes there are questions, sometimes there aren't. But I will go ahead and show you this is something we've been working on for a while and it's very much in progress. And we're working on it's going to be a rather large book called Inventory. And uh, one of our we have been making these small pieces, triangle squares. I'm just going to quickly run through it. Um, yeah, they and, sort of reminded me of the work we did in England with small box. Right. Yeah. So these are just still the eventually they're going to be this book, but these are, are we made the, all the all the little triangles, all the little squares that you'll see are analog and these are digital setups of them and these will be part of this book called Inventory. We don't know where it's going yet, but it's been going for a while and this is an inventory of the pieces that we have so far. Mm. We have a question here. Um, sure. Oh, Patty Smith, right? Who is in the story you just told Diane? Patty Smith and Allen Ginsberg, is that right? Patty Smith and, and the poet Allen Ginsberg. So Allen Ginsberg was much her senior, the beat poet, and Patty Smith, musician and poet and philosopher. And um and the book that she wrote is called Just Kids. Her Life with Maple Thorpe. Right. Photographer. He had already died by the time she wrote that book, but she had promised him that she would write mm -hmm. that book. Thank you. Thank Maybe. you. We have another question here. Okay. They, yeah, they've been collaborating over 30 years. Um, it's pretty impressive. I mean, it's one of... It's so inspirational to me, your collaboration, I have to say. Um, and we do have a question in the chat. It says, how do people buy your work? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, at exhibitions, they can buy our work. And also um, my website has uh, almost all of this work will be on my website, which is dianefine.com. Simple as that, just dianefine.com. And you'd be able to inquire. We don't have prices on the website, but you'd be able to inquire. And that website is my website. And there's a section that's my collaborations with Mario. So we are very interested in selling our work. <laughs> always. It's well, always it's a finding pleasure. finding a home for them more than, you know, right. finding, Definitely a home finding giving a them home a life. Them. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I don't know if, if Noreen Sadu was able to be here for this talk but i was at visiting her not too long ago and saw um the piece um i'm not remembering what anyway i didn't even know like i forgot that noreen had it and there it was mm. in her beautiful home right so that's that's uh, really a blessing to find homes for the pieces so by don't be shy ask uh, go to the website and ask us uh i do yep yeah, one more one more question uh, do you, well, they have press names. What are your two presses names? Are you, do you refer to Oh, Mooncosh Press is Diane. Mooncosh and Gravel, like gravel, gravel. on the road. Gravel. G -R -A. Mm -hmm. And or yeah, gravel. if you Google those, you'll, you'll get, you'll certainly get things. But the website that is pretty comprehensive, although this most recent work has yet to be uploaded, I'll do that soon is dianefine.com. And, and you know, the way, collaboration and over time, Lorraine, I just- Lorraine has sorry. a question for us, Diane. Okay. Hi there. 
Um, this was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. And Diane, I've had the great pleasure to collaborate with you and put some haiku poetry in your images. Oh, and you're. Mario. You are the person. Well, that's right. yeah. well. I love that yes. word. So that, that lovely balancing stones. What was that called? Standing stones. Yes. Standing stones, yes. Which I was able to put a poem to. So I just wanted to thank you so much for, for lending me that work. It was just an oh. honor and a beautiful oh. piece. Thank you. It was a beautiful thank piece, yeah. Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. That's yeah, actually a wonderful collaboration right there. Yeah, right. It it's three-way collaboration and Mario and Lorraine are just meeting for the first time. Mm. So yeah, and um, you know, that that 30 plus years is um I want I have and Mario has too collaborated with other people. And I think one of the things that's unique about us is it's been ongoing. It's without without any hiatuses, mm -hmm. if that's the I don't know, hiatai. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what the plural of hiatus is, but um, <laughs> ongoing, and it should, it 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 should, you know, my wish is that it it continue for as you know another 30 plus years. Mm, I so hope so too, Diane. Thanks, Mario. So it looks like Jennifer has a question about having any tips or advice for current graphic design students. Hmm. Well, you know, interestingly, Mario pointed out we both studied graphic design as undergraduates mm -hmm. and then we both went to printmaking. I don't I can't speak for you, Mario, but I know you did printmaking as an undergrad and that was really my my first love. And it was leaving school. You know, I made the decision that I wanted to pursue that and went to graduate school for printmaking. But um, I think the way in which we use the work uh, the, we, the way in which we use um, that our graphic design training informed us in our work is typographically. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you know this if you're a graphic design student, you can't, you know, you can't know enough about type, the history of type, the use of type. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, I mean, obviously there's many other things involved with graphic design, but recently, um, who sent this to me? I think Tracy Hahn sent me um, a website and you, you have my contact information. So if anyone's interested in this, I can get this to you, which is um, uh, what's it called? Something like type fonts, fonts, F-O-N-T-S, fonts in use. And you can, you know, when you're choosing a font, whether you're just doing something, you know, writing a letter to someone or writing a grant proposal or or doing a graphic design piece or an art piece, you're like, whoever uses blah, 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 right? You look through all the choices of fonts and there's so many there, but probably very few that you actually use. So this site, like you can choose a font and it shows you some barber shop in Zimbabwe where they're using that font. So it's really, really cool to see how people make use of things that you couldn't imagine Mm -hmm. you know, what that particular font would be used for. So, I mean, I, I don't know that that's answering your question, but I think, you know, for, for us, our experiences specifically with with type and um, type design. Anything else? No more questions here. Thank you so much, everyone, oh, for your you. time. And I can't wait to see what this new work comes out like. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're taking inventory of it. See, here it is. See, wow. look how look how orderly it is compared to this. Oh, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So yeah, I need to do. I need to do. If this is my house. I need my house to become like this. Yeah. <laughs> within reason. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I appreciate the opportunity. It was lovely. Thank you, Diane. Thanks, Thank you, Melanie. Mario. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye, everybody. Signing wonderful, out. Wonderful. Signing out.